You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. And in English, even if it's like striking a stone with an egg and courting self destruction like a moth to the flame. I will tell the truth about you. These are some of the final words used in a post on Weibo, China's version of Twitter, on November 2nd by Peng Shui. Three weeks ago, maybe you had no idea who she is. But now, there's a very good chance you know some of the biggest stars in tennis. Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, Novak Djokovic, have been on Twitter over the past seven days asking just one question. Where is Peng Shui? And now the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, and more, have added their voices, calling for her to be allowed to speak freely. At the same time, Chinese state media have been using Twitter, which is banned in China, to try and say the opposite. They are posting photos and videos which essentially say, here she is, she's fine. My name is Mimi Lau, and this week on the Inside China podcast, we're going to ask some more questions about Peng Shui. What does Peng Shui mean to China's Me Too movement? Why has the Women's Tennis Association threatened to cancel a billion-dollar investment in China unless they hear from her? Why is China's state-controlled media spending so much effort to influence the global media narrative about her? And why did the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, get involved in this? Let's start with the content of what Peng Shui posted on Weibo and why no one can find any mention of it, either on Chinese social media or anywhere on the other side of the Great Firewall that separates China's netizens from the World Wide Web. Who is the person she wanted to tell the truth about? Peng Shui laid an accusation in her heavyweight Weibo post on November 2nd against former Vice Premier Zhang Gaoli, in it, she accused him of coercing her into sex several years ago. Zhang Gaoli was one of the seven most powerful leaders of the Chinese Communist Party from 2012 to 2017, and one of the seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee. Basically, it's the most powerful committee in the Beijing government. Also, Zhang served as a head of the Beijing Winter Olympics Working Group from 2015 to 2018. And if you would just do a Google image search, it's easy to find a photo of him shaking hands with Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee in 2016. While Zhang is also known for keeping a very low profile and rarely makes public appearances or speeches. So it's not a surprise that Zhang has made no public comment in response to the allegation. Simone McCarthy, welcome back to the podcast studio. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, people on Twitter are still asking, hashtag, where is Peng Shui? But can you take us back a couple of weeks ago to where all this started on Chinese social media and unpack what the world has witnessed and how did that play out on Western social media over the past five days? Yeah, sure. So it started on November 2nd when Peng Shui posted on her official Weibo account an accusation that she was coerced into having sex with the former vice premier, now retired, Zhang Gaoli. And essentially that was wiped from the Chinese internet in a matter of minutes, really. And then all mention of that was scrubbed from the Chinese internet. And so while that effectively died, as far as the internet ecosystem in China, it was 
obviously picked up by Western media. It's not until the chief executive of the WTA who finally put this on the international agenda. That's right. On the 14th, uh, Simon comes out with a statement which is prominently displayed on their website and social media channels. And it says, you know, Peng Shui and all women deserve to be heard, not censored. It calls for... Um, it calls for a serious uh, investigation into the accusation. Um, and it also just says that, you know, as, as a women's tennis organization, we expect equality for women and respect for women. So that really does spark then an outpouring of a number of athletes, uh, high profile tennis stars and others, and as well as other tennis organizations coming forward. And um, and then the, the hashtag, where is Peng Shui, also beginning to, to take off. And we see figures like Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, uh, posting and, and asking questions as well. And that really gives out the message that they are taking this personally. That's absolutely right. And I think it's something where once there got to be that critical mass of a few really powerful voices speaking out, then many, many others joined in as well. We have seen a, a series of escalated responses. Can you run us past that as well? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, at the core of this, we have this hashtag, where is Peng Shui? And that's because... She has disappeared from public view completely. And so what we start to see over the past five or so days is that state media affiliated personalities, editors mainly, are taking it upon themselves to begin to share images or information about her, um, not coming from her directly, uh, but through their own channels. And so um, the first one that we see with that is CGTN, uh, obviously China's overseas English language broadcaster, um, in the early morning on uh, Thursday, posts an email which is purported to be from Peng um, that is sent to the WTA. And basically, she says, the accusations are false, and um, I'm resting at home, uh, I'm, I'm fine. And so this sparks a quick response from WTA, who is not satisfied with this email. It also sparks a lot of um, just major questions and, and amplifies the concern. I mean, there's even a cursor that's visible in the screenshot of the email. There's just a lot of questions that are raised, like, why is this being shared by CGTN? Obviously, in mainland China, there is a still a mass censorship of this. So we're not, this is all playing out on international media. And we also, again, see some more um, stern comments from Simon, who actually goes so far as to say that he will pull the WTA tournaments out of China. Um, he says that in an interview to CNN, and then the he goes actually and sends a letter to the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. and again reiterate that comment again. And that's when we started seeing pictures being posted on Twitter showing Peng uh, smiling in a room full of stuffed animals. That's exactly right. So we see uh, Shen Shiwei of CGTN, who is posting that, saying it's coming from Peng's own WeChat. Um, and then the following day, we have uh, Hu Shijin of the Global Times coming out with videos of Peng, which are purporting to be taken that Saturday evening at a restaurant in Beijing. And the eerie thing about those videos is that we see in one of these clips that the camera, it's showing her walking into the restaurant or purporting to, but it lingers on the, the certificate, which would say the last time that the restaurant was disinfected. And so you can see that it's in November. And then in the following clip, we see um, the co-director of China Open, a member of the dinner party, stating the date and then being corrected that he said the wrong date. Oh, no, it's, it's you know, tomorrow is not November 20th. It's November 21st, being corrected by a woman at the table. And then he repeats that what tomorrow's date is again. So it's very clearly they're trying to say this is a current video. Um, and actually, Hu Shijin in his tweet even said, oh, the content of the video shows that this is current. So that was, again, uh, actually, again, WTA comes out and says, 
okay, we're not satisfied by this. It's good to see these images purporting to be of Peng, but this is not enough. She's not speaking for herself. Um, And they had also called for an investigation into her allegations, which is certainly not something that we're seeing in a video of her going out to a restaurant. And then it was the following morning where she made an appearance at a, a youth tennis tournament in Beijing. And so there were some photos of that which were posted on the official WeChat of the China Open. So this all sounds like a propaganda battle that's been played out entirely on Twitter um, with China state media posting these images and videos. Is there any mention to be found of Peng Shuai on Chinese social media? Well, Mimi, let's pull it up. I have my computer open now, so... Let's try Baidu first. Okay, sure. Baidu is the equivalent to Google in the U.S. and Weibo is the equivalent of Twitter in China. Tell us what you found. Okay, so when I search Peng Shuai on on Baidu, basically there are there's a full page of results here, but they're from 2012, 2010, 2013, 2017. They're all um, her various tennis victories, and there's nothing remotely recent um, on this page. And then when we go over to Weibo and run this search and look for her personal account or mention of her, let's do personal account first, there's no results found. And then when we look at all the results, we see... Just one come up, um, which is from this month. The French embassy has a has a statement here. Nothing before that. What did that statement from the French embassy say? It's a Q and A here, and it basically asks if the French government has concerns about the safety of Peng Shui. And the answer is that yeah, they are concerned about the lack of information, and the international and sports community has also expressed concern. So is there any response officially made by the Chinese government? There was silence up until this week following the IOC call. And at that point, we had um, China's foreign ministry spokespeople um, in their regular scheduled media briefings basically saying yesterday that she had attended public activities recently and then that uh, certain people should stop the malicious hyping of the issue. And those are as reported by Reuters. But we have yet to, as an international public, we have yet to hear Peng Shuai herself speak. So how is Peng Shuai's story resonating with China's Me Too movement? And how is her example being viewed by Chinese Feminists. Hi, my name is Xiao Wen. Xiao Wen Liang is a feminist activist based in New York who was forced to leave China five years ago after her family and colleagues were threatened by the state police over her campaigns. This is what she thinks about whether China's Me Too movement will be re energized by the worldwide attention on Peng Shui. Um, to be honest, the truth is, um, it, as much as many people might have read Peng Shuai's post on the night of November 2nd on on Weibo. It was taken down 20 minutes later. So not a lot of people are able to see that. The mass definitely don't doesn't know about what's going on. And Peng Shuai's name was being censored. Um, people were not allowed to talk about it uh, or discuss about this case, even though the, the international community is talking about um, Peng Shai and asking um, if she's safe for the past three weeks. And then if you put Peng and Shai together, your post will be automatically deleted or censored. Or the worst thing is you might even be banned from speaking for the next 30 days. So that's what's happening right now. So there's no way that people can inv- evaluate if young women will be empowered or I- inspired by Peng Shai's coming forward when when few people are allowed to speak about it. To be honest, because of the person that Peng Shai is accused of, Zhang Gaoli, he is a former really, really high level official. The fact that he is 
who he is would make people scared of talking about it because of the potential repression. People were not given the space to talk about this, but people are concerned. Young women, Chinese feminists who knew about this, are concerned. Tennis fans,、um, football fans, are concerned. They want to know what's happening. They've been asking questions. They are they are inventing codes so that they can exchange information. Like tennis players, or even the word tennis players, were were being censored in some way. Um, only pe- only accounts like Weibo accounts that are verified can use the word tennis players without being censored. And if your account is not being verified, your post about tennis players might not even be able to shown. The whole algorithm is making people very difficult to discuss. Still, people are trying. Like they would post every time a celebrity is speaking up for her,、um, without mentioning what the celebrity is talking about. People would like name her in the social media, trying to get some influence or trying to spread the news. I would say many people are trying and trying really hard, but still people are afraid to talk about it. And while all discussion is banned on China's social media, as we heard from Simone McCarthy, China's state media has been very busy on Twitter distributing images and videos trying to say Peng Shuai is okay. And since last Sunday, the world's media outlets have been publishing a still image of Peng Shuai appearing on a video call with Thomas Bach, the president of the International Olympic Committee. There's a saying in Chinese called "yi yi zhi yi." It means to use foreigners to subdue foreigners. Does Xiao Wen think China's state media have won? Have they effectively influenced the Western media narrative on the story of Peng Shuai? I would say so. Like、um, this morning, I've read news from the Western media saying that the International Olympic Committee or the IOC has confirmed that Peng Shuai is safe, and she is in this video conference. She accepted an invitation from IOC、um, to meet. The, the the determining person in the future, like all of all of those are concern is concerning, because it basically discredit the international rally, the international tennis rally to support her. I, I've I've said it so many times, like she might be physically safe, but she's definitely not free of expressing herself. She's at a place where she's not able to to tell people what she's experiencing and control of the narrative. Doesn't just mean showing some smiling images of Peng Shuai posing with fluffy toys in her bedroom and signing autographs. It also means censoring any mention of her original post on Weibo. The post was so brave and so courageous. She did not use the word "me too" in her post, but but the whole story that she she tried to tell. You can see, you can see how hurt she was for for the past decades. She was so young when this happened to her, and she even used the word love to describe this relationship. And she also told that she was not consensual when it first happened when she was so young in her early twenties. And now, through the email, she's denying. She's saying that the allegations were not true. It's like the same thing is all over. Is it? It's happening all over again. So she was not able to talk about this for the past past ten to fifteen years, and now she she finally had enough and decided to speak up. And this video conference is basically trying to discredit all the pain that she's going through. Xiao Wen says there's something else to think about with the published image and quotes from Peng Shuai's video conference with IOC President Thomas Bach. A lot of Chinese feminists already mentioned that the reason that she spoke up is not asking for justice because she knew there's she's not going to get the justice that she deserves because that's how the system works right now. Like the men in power. Can be abusive, and they treat women as something that's disposable, and they treat women however they want, and they don't give women justice. 
and now Peng Shui's had enough. She has so much courage to speak this up. So I cannot imagine what happened to her for the past two weeks or three weeks. Like what's going on with her? I I also wondered if she knew that the whole world is supporting her. I don't know if she knew how many people from the tennis community, like Billie Jean King, Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, all those people are speaking up for her. I I I was wondering if she knew that all those people are rooting for her. She deserves to know about this. And I I don't think IOC is telling her about this. I don't know if she knew what, during that video conference. So I don't think the video conference with IOC is is safe for her. Is a safe place for her. I don't think it's fair. So what does it mean for the broader feminist movement in China right now? Has there been a new level of repression of feminism in general this year? As you already know, like ever since 2018, the Me Too movement in China has developed so much. Like so many women, young women, feminists, men are joining this movement, becoming part of this movement, despite of their like very diverse background. Um, they are empowered by the message of Me Too movement, and they spoke up. And I believe, yes, the the movement is so powerful and has influenced so many people that the crackdown is more serious because I believe the censors, obviously the government has realized how powerful and influential this movement can be. Peng Shai's story is just a testament to how influential and powerful this mo- movement are to young women and women in general. Uh, for the past year, in 2021, one of the things that we witness as feminist, like Chinese feminists is that not to mention that the offline physical campaigns are almost like very, very difficult and dangerous to do. The online campaigns are more and more difficult as well. For example, um, in the case Xianzi versus Zhu Jun, um, Xianzi is a very active and influential Me Too activist who brought a lawsuit against the CCTV host, a state-run media host of sexual harassment. And then when this judgment was rendered this year, Right after this judgment was rendered, Xianzi's Weibo account was being banned from speaking for a year. And so many other Me Too activists and feminists, or even they are, they don't identify themselves as feminists, they're just supporters for Xianzi, their account would be banned simply because they support Xianzi. However, on the other hand, the sexual harassers and the sexual harassers supporters and the attackers of Me Too movement, their accounts would not be deleted. If you go on Weibo and you searched Me Too movement, all you see is how dangerous this movement is can be. A lot of false accusations exist. And then the worst of all, the movement is supported by to name a few Biden, I would say like that it's being supported by the Western so that China's power can be undermined. That's the point of view of the attackers of the Me Too movement. The pushback, the portrayal of Me Too as a foreign attack on China, and the repression by online bullying of women wanting to share the Me Too stories on social media in China has increased significantly this year. But let's get deeper into this battle for the narrative. Yesterday, China's foreign ministry made its formal response, where foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian issued a statement about Peng Shui in his weekly media briefing. I believe everyone will have seen that she has recently attended some public activities and also held a video call with IOC President Buck. I hope certain people will cease malicious hyping, let alone politicization. Hype. Politics but nothing of the original accusation. So, let's get a bit deeper into this battle for this thing called the narrative 
not telling you what to think, but telling you what to think about. Peter Lawrenson is a professor who specializes in the economics of information as well as researching governance and social control in China. We're seeing a China that is more assertive and aggressive than ever before. Does it surprise you that China come out with such a timely and direct response to the international tennis community and social media's question about where is Peng Shuai? Well, I think they they do feel the need to have some response in in almost every case. I think um, the the key is they. I think they're very concerned about the Olympics, and they really needed to provide the IOC with kind of a, a plausible deniability, or at least enough of a you know mixed message, like maybe nothing's going on, so they can pretend that nothing happened and and move forward uh, and not face international pressure about the Olympics. Um, and also, I think the they probably are aware that they stepped into a little bit more of a of a situation than in the past because. In the past, it was maybe you know uh, things in happening in Hong Kong or Tibet or Xinjiang, but they were kind of abstract to Americans and to also the athletes. You know, so they may have had you know strong moral feelings about uh, what they thought should happen, but most Americans, it's like okay, well, you know, there's always bad things happening around the world, and you know that's part of the joy of sport is maybe even though bad things are happening, we can all get together and you know have a friendly competition and and hope for the day when when we won't have these conflicts. But in this case, it's not really. It's it's more personal, I think, for especially the members of the, um, the the female tennis players to know that there's been an allegation of sexual assault by one of the women that they played with, um, one of their friends, and that she then not only made this allegation, which had, that has not been responded to at all, uh, but then also disappeared out of sight, um, pretty clearly under duress for for a period of time, and still has you know as of as of today has not made an independent public uh, appearance that wasn't mediated by some kind of uh, party handlers. So it's a an issue that's much more tricky to resolve than just sort of Americans being unhappy or unhappy and Europeans as well, you know, the world being unhappy or expressing concerns uh, in a general sense about human rights violations or, or lack of democracy in some part of China. It's, it's a very specific thing that directly affects the athletes um, and, and feels very personal to them. Also, there's a factor about this external propaganda China wants to put out with the Winter Olympics approaching soon, huh? The Chinese authorities want to take this as an opportunity to, uh, again, you know, present the image of a successful and, and ideally maybe, you know, approachable China, although I think the success and the power is more important to them. And I'm sure there's a lot of people within the Chinese system who have a lot riding in this. I mean, Xi Jinping, you know, it's probably not the most important thing to him, but there's someone within the party for whom it is the most important thing and it's going to make or break their career how well this goes off. So seeing something like this that could that could really throw a wrench in it, I think they were smart to recognize that they had to move pretty quickly to to take action, to try to head off a, some kind of direct confrontation. And, and especially, you know, it's clear that they, they ignored the Women's Tennis Association, um, which had been most firm and upfront about it, but, they, but then they did their sort of video exercise, video chat with, with the IOC so that the IOC could, which had the most incentive to sort of accept whatever they said at, at face value, could then say, ah, yeah, well, you see, everything is in fact fine. Looking at the way uh, the level responses have been escalating over the weekend, first from the CGTN saying Peng Shuai is safe, then a state media reporter is releasing uh, WeChat photos belong to Peng Shuai on Twitter, and then the IOC video chat, and then the public appearance of Peng Shuai in a tennis event. How do you see China is trying to, you know, throughout this process, trying to control the international narrative over this incident, and how effective has that been? I think for the people who who understand China or who are following the case very closely, there is very little confusion, but that is probably not their goal. I think their goal is to have that plausible deniability so that the, you know, again, that the IOC can go ahead with the Olympics and say that in fact, everything's fine. And, you know, you know we don't have to worry about this and also, and other, you know, international governments like who are, you know, they need to think about, do we want to be the one who's pulling out of the Olympics or, or challenging the Olympics? Because the Olympics does have this, you know, admirable tradition, again, of being the place where we come together and we compete in sports and we root for our own side. But, you know, we are doing so in a peaceful manner and uh, the hostilities are, you know, sublimated into, into redirected into sports as opposed to, you know, more harmful conflict. And so, you know, there is something to be to be celebrated in that. 
Um, but then, of course, the tension is then, you know, are we validating, uh, you know, a regime or, or a set of actions that, that we view in, is fundamentally in contrast to our values? And, and sometimes which one of those matters can can change in, in different times. So, so they felt like they had to give um, so the external propaganda. So one is to to give that kind of excuse and then also for the IOC. And then also, I think for um, you and I and people listening to this podcast are probably following this issue closely, but people who aren't. For them, you know, something else will enter the media or maybe they, you know, weren't even listening to the news this week. They were in America and just focused on Thanksgiving and, you know, whatever. Um, and so they weren't really paying attention. And then later they might hear about it. And the key thing is they'll say, oh, well, some, you know, some female tennis player made some kind of accusations in China. But then, you know, and people thought this is this is what they want people to think. Someone, some accusations were made. This woman like dropped out of sight briefly, but then she came back and it was totally fine. And if you aren't really paying close attention, and you don't really realize what the issues are here, then then that might be something that um, uh, an ordinary American might believe, or at least might find to be credible. Just as in the case of you know Hong Kong or Xinjiang, you know the the Communist Party has its way that it wants to present events and other people have uh, very different opinions, but it can put together some footage and some people who will, you know, present a certain picture. And that, uh, again, leaves people, leaves enough people feeling ambiguous that, that there's that kind of credible doubt. So in, essentially, they release enough information to answer that simple question posted by the social media, that is, where is Peng Shui? Also enough to create a level of ambiguity to get away without getting to the crust of the issue, right? And so, so the uh, Women's Tennis Association, um, I thought was it was great that they they immediately latched onto this and highlighted this point in their uh, reaction to the the IOC um, staged event. They said, you know, okay, you've shown that she's most likely alive, but that wasn't really the question, you know. I mean, and you said, where is she? Okay, she is you know, in a room with stuffed animals and with some people who appear to be friendly with her. And, and she's smiling. And um, yeah, there was one of one of the, I forget which, uh, one of the Global Times Twitter commentators or something is like, look, she's smiling and women can never smile if they're not actually happy, which um, I don't know, I guess he doesn't have many women who speak with him honestly, because I have heard actually many people, men and women are very good at smiling when um, they're under great duress. And in fact, uh, you know, many Chinese people have had to, you know, historically have had to smile through an awful lot of uh, things, um, you know, and that's uh, so. So, the, but, you know, again, they're just trying to put out this narrative to, to get it out there. That's Peter Lawrenson from the University of San Francisco. But let's turn back to the central character here, Peng Shui and the professional sporting body that has been instrumental in keeping her welfare and her story on the international news agenda for the past two weeks. Josh Ball is deputy editor of the Sports Desk here at the South China Morning Post. Josh, Peng Shui is a state-trained elite athlete, but can you give us a character sketch of who she is as an athlete and what is her background and what is her status as a player in China? I think as a, I think as a player in China, she's... It's very difficult to say. I, I mean, she she's achieved things that no other player has achieved. She's twice won a Grand Slam. She won Wimbledon ladies doubles. She won the French Open ladies doubles. She's been to the Olympics twice, three times. You know, she's won multiple tour events. She got to 14th in the world as a singles player. She's beaten Williams, Sharapova. This is this is she's an exceptionally good tennis player. She's not just an average tour player. She is someone who had was the face of Chinese tennis for a long time. So she is she is absolutely someone who has been out there. She's well known. You can't there was a time in China when tennis was her and she was tennis. So it's very much a it, it's been that kind of relationship for a long time. An I icon. Think. Yes. Yeah, very much so. I think icon is a is a good word. We overuse it sometimes, but I think in this instance it absolutely applies. So, Josh, much has been made about the Women's Tennis Association, the WTA, taking a harsh stand on behalf of Peng Shui. This would appear to be at odds with its plan for expansion in China. 
What sort of investment have they got in China at the moment? Well, I mean, they they moved the the finals of the the singles tour to Shenzhen, and this was going to be this was going to be a massive investment. It, it was estimated that there was going to be something in the region of about a billion US generated by this investment. It enabled them to increase the prize purses. The women actually for the fight, the WTA finals were going to earn more than the men were because of this kind of investment. And it, obviously China is a massive market. And if you are any sport, if you can crack the Chinese market, it increases the revenue that you have and allows you to do so many things with your tour throughout the rest of the world. So for the WTA, getting into the Chinese market opened up so many doors. I mean, two of their main sponsors are Porsche and SAP, both of whom have massive presence in China. I think for Porsche now, it's their largest market. They're talking about building factories there. So everything really was tied in with this push into China. There's supposed to be 10 tournaments in China next year. The calendar hasn't been released yet, but that was what they were talking about. So there's a, again, it's deeply ingrained, or they were trying to become deeply ingrained within within China. Did you think it was at odd in the comment attributed Peng Shuai that she thanked the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, uh, in that video chat, but had no words of thanks for the WTA, who had been so vocal about her welfare? Um, I think it said a lot for the situation that maybe she found herself in. I think that there were a lot of questions to have been asked about that entire setup. Uh, I know that a lot of people have raised questions about it. I know the IOC have taken a lot of flack for it because in some regards it may well have been seen as, you don't want to use the word pandering to, um, to, to China, but the IOC certainly has a conflict of interest because of the Winter Games and because of everything else that follows from it. Um, so yeah, I think the fact that she didn't mention the WTA, that she didn't acknowledge all of that, uh, said a lot without saying without saying anything at all, to be honest. Uh, can, can I get you to talk to us about the significance of the IOC being brought in in this situation and and, and to issue one photo of Peng Shuai having uh, 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 to, and to issue a photo of Peng Shuai on a big screen, um, talking to people in a room in Beijing in a video chat that. We never get to hear her own voice. So I, I think we, I think we need to go back to when this all started, and the uh, the IOC were very reticent to say anything, uh, apart from talking about quiet diplomacy. And um, this has always been the uh, the way the IOC operates. They they're very hesitant to ever get involved in anything that might be deemed to be morally right, shall we say. Um, but I, I think that this maybe this was what they thought was quite a diplomacy. Maybe they thought this would help smooth things over. That the that eventually, in a couple of weeks' time, Peng Shui would be allowed to leave China, and then it could all just be smoothed over. And by the time February rolls around and the Winter Olympics is here, and every the eyes of the world are on Beijing for multiple reasons, then it wouldn't cause the kind of embarrassing clash that the IOC hates to see. Um, so I, I think that was I think that was probably the motivation behind it, to be honest. So the IOC has yeah. been being seen as a um, friendly ally of China in handling the Peng Shui incident. I think that the IOC has played this badly right the way down the line. I think they have completely misread the situation. I think that Thomas Bach made an appalling decision by doing it because if he was going to do it, if he, if he thought that this was the best way to solve the problem, the one thing that he absolutely should have done was have Steve Simon on the call. That's the, I mean, it's the simplest, easiest solution. That, you, that way you give it a credibility which, even, even if it doesn't have it privately, publicly you've kind of put the fire out a little bit. And they, they've failed miserably to do that. They've just made it worse in many respects. Because, you know, S Steve Simon has come out and said, well, I'm sorry, this doesn't do it for me. I, don't, I still don't believe that everything is okay. 
Basically, and, uh, everyone's credibility has been trashed up until now. Yeah, pretty much. I think so. I think the only, it, amazingly, and it doesn't happen very often, I think the only people who've come out of this with increased credibility are the WTA and some of the female tennis players. It, it's a, you look at their response compared to some of the responses from sports organizations in the past, and it's, it's ethical, it's moral, it's almost unheard of in many respects. That's quite a contrast um, to how this has played out uh, so far compared to what happened with an NBA uh, general manager who tweeted a uh, comment about Hong Kong two years ago. Huh? No, absolutely, it has. And I mean, you know, Daryl Morey, the Houston Rockets GM, it was, I mean, it wasn't an innocuous tweet, but it was a, it was a supportive tweet given what was going on in the city at the time. And uh, the NBA were falling all over themselves to put that fire out. The The owner of the Rockets, hours later, sent a message saying, we are not a political organization. This is just about sport. LeBron James obviously very famously got himself dragged into it by saying people should think before they tweet, which for the, the best player potentially of all time and certainly of the last 10, 15 years, to say something like that carries some weight. I mean, he suffered some backlash for it because previously he'd, he, he had a very interesting tweet in January 2018. And he tweeted a, a Martin Luther King quote. And what he said was, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And this was obviously referring to Kaepernick and all, Colin Kaepernick and all the things that were going on. I think what we have to look at, though, is the amount of money that was involved. The NBA conservatively lost between 150 and 200 million US just because of that tweet. And it damaged reputations. Now, if your job as a sporting organization is to make money, then you can kind of understand that approach. But then you also then you're going to lose any right to get involved in other social issues. You know, I mean, it's all very well wearing a t-shirt or taking a knee, because that really doesn't achieve anything. So why do you think uh, we are seeing such a different uh, response a few years later with the tennis players? I think that there is a movement, not a mo maybe a shift, maybe a slight shift, that recognises that there are things that, if they are morally wrong, or if you believe them to be morally wrong, then money cannot be an excuse. And I think the, WT, the WTA and a lot of their players are socially conscious, and this is something they believe. Also, it's one of their own. This isn't a GM. This isn't someone who's tweeted something. This is someone they've shared a locker room with, they've played against, they've toured with, that you know, they'll have been out to dinner with. This is a friend. It's a, an athlete. It's a fellow competitor. And, and that changes the relationship too, especially in a small world like tennis, especially when you're touring so often. So I think I think those are all part of the equation. So it looks like the WTA um, and Steve Simon, they will be looking a huge amount of damage here. But is it really the case? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think maybe financially there's going to be a hit. But then that's a different that's a different question entirely again, because obviously in the way the world is at the moment, if you don't know when there's going to be the resumption of normal sport, especially with the the strategy China is adopting, so maybe your financial hit isn't going to be as bad as it might have been. I think also if you look at, again, like I said, if you look at the WTA, they come out of this looking really good. They, you know, they are, they are winning this PR battle. If As much as you hate to look at it like that, they, they are. They're, they're the ones who've led this from the front. They're the ones who are driving it. They're the ones who've refused to let it go. Um, you know, normally in the a story's shelf life, normally would be 24 hours in the news cycle and then it would quietly disappear into the background and this hasn't happened. And I, I think that Steve Simon's not just talking to China at this point. Steve Simon is talking to tennis players, he's talking to fans, he's talking to the next generation of fans, he's talking to the people he wants to be involved in the game once we do get back to normal, you know, once the world does start going round again. Also... If you want to look at it from another point of view, if you're a sponsor and you want to be involved in an ethical sporting organization 
and you know that the next generation of fans who are coming are very socially conscious, then you could do worse than being attached to the WTA. There is something money just can't buy. Sure, there absolutely is. There absolutely is. But I also, I think we should probably also give Steve Simon some credit because I think as a CEO of a large sporting organisation, it would have been very easy, very easy to not hide from it, but palm it off, you know, play it off, do do what the IOC did and, and fudge it a little bit. Or, you know, some of their sponsors just haven't said a thing. So I, I think that that, that comes in but I, I think I think you can you can tell a lot from who he is as a per, as a man as a person as a leader from something he said on CNN the other night you know he said that we have to start as a world making decisions that are based upon right and wrong period we can't compromise that and we're definitely willing to pull our business and de- deal with all the complications that come with it because this is bigger than the business so I mean there's obviously a man there who is taking a moral stance because he's got to, he's he's found something that he he's not willing to look the other way on and i think that that's for me that's very impressive instead of ending this podcast with a man talking about a man i think it's only fair that we give the last word to xiao wen liang on what the future holds what does she think might happen next for peng shui I don't know, but I think it's up to us. Like it's up to every one of us to, to not to stop paying attention to her um, until she is really free um, to speak her mind. And I, I do appreciate a lot about the international community's voice for her. That's really important, and that's what keeps the censorship. Even more difficult,、um, so that people are actually paying a lot of attention to her case. And the more attention that she has, the more protection that she ha- she's going to get. So I really appreciate that, and I really do hope that this story will keep trending despite all the efforts, like all those efforts of video conferences or emails,、um, that's trying to discredit the international campaign and her public allegations against the former Chinese leader. Very often on this podcast, we tell you there's more to come on the story and to stay tuned for more development. Perhaps like no other story we have done this year, there are many more developments to come. It's no longer just where is Peng Shui. How is Peng Shui? Can we hear more from Peng Shui? Can she talk freely? Will this affect the Beijing Olympic Games in February? You will read the latest developments and get the best analysis from me, Simon McCarthy, and the China Desk, as well as Josh on the Sports Desk at the South China Morning Post and SCMP.com. My name is Mimi Lau. Find me at Twitter at gzmimi. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.